I'm here today to open up a conversation about death and dying, a subject many of us may be reluctant to talk about, but also to recognise death as one of the most powerful teachers for me in life. This is my dad. Dad is the first of a number of people who I'm bringing with me to help me with this talk this afternoon. I grew up in a vicarage, and Dad was, my, was the vicar. The subject of death was very present for me and all of our family. In fact, the undertaker laid out the bodies of my dad's parishioners in the loft above our garage. Every, every week the phone would ring and us children would run to get it. And very often it would be the undertaker who in the same monotone voice would use the same words and he would say, hello, is your father in? It's about a death which of course we always knew it was. In our house, dying was not shrouded in mystery. It was very much a part of life. We often think of death as a medical matter to hand over to um, doctors and funeral professionals. And this isn't helped by the fact that relatively few of us have been with a dying person or seen a dying body or a dead body, particularly not when we're young. And a recent Lancet Commission report found that dying people are whisked away to hospitals or hospices. And whereas two generations ago, most children would have seen a dead body, people may now be in their 40s or 50s without ever seeing a dead person. And then there was Emma. When I was in my 20s, my friend Emma died in a car crash. When I arrived at her funeral, her Sudanese and Kenyan friends asked me to help them wash and massage her body with oils, a cultural honouring and a final act of love. But I was frightened. I feared that I wouldn't be able to be with Emma's body, which was very broken. And so I let other caring hands do this gentle work. Later, I was sad that I hadn't taken part in this final farewell. Emma. Years later, whilst working with artists with children with terminal illnesses in a London hospital, I found myself once again coming up close to death and dying. These children, in the wise and honest way that only young children can, taught me about the importance of finding ways to talk about death, and also the role of the arts and creativity in this. One young girl made this picture, and she wrote a poem which began, Once upon a time, there was a young princess who often didn't feel well. For all of her life, she was often sick. And she finished her poem. The stars had clustered together to form a ladder. The prince gripped onto it. He closed his eyes and carefully walked down, step by step, straight into the princess's room. For children in intensive care, the subject of death and dying is perhaps even more of a taboo than anywhere else in society. They want to protect their parents, and they're very grateful for their medical care. Whatever we may read into these metaphors, poetry and art here had offered a place, a language for the imagination. For this little girl, to speak of some, something of what it's like to be coming to the end of a very short life. And then on a spring day, walking with my friend Katie, death became my teacher once again. This is Katie. She was 51, a writer and a mother of two girls aged 12 and 14 and one of my closest friends. In 1996, she was diagnosed with breast cancer and successfully treated until 2010. When the cancer came back, and by the autumn of that year, she was told that there was no more that could be done. On all this walk, Katie turned to me and she said, Anna, if this can't be treated, then I want you to be there to help Marcus and the girls at the end. They're going to need you to help them. I was stunned. I'm shocked, and I struggled to think of anything to say that might bring hope. But then I paused and realised that Katie really just needed me to acknowledge what she was only just beginning to acknowledge for herself, that she might die. She needed me to say yes 
to this profoundly important request. And so I did. But then she said, and that's it now. I don't want to talk about it anymore. You'll know what to do when the time comes. And in that moment, I lost the opportunity to ask any of the questions that might have helped me when some months later it became clear that I'd need to keep my promise. By the end of November, I moved into her house for what turned out to be the last week of her life. And in that week, she taught me so much. Not only about grace, vulnerability, and resilience, but also about what is needed in a family when a deeply loved life partner and a mother of two young girls is dying. And what was needed was for the normality of this warm, humorous family to continue. And this required gentle facilitation because Katie could no longer do this herself. So together with her husband, we maintained the familiar family rituals, cooking roast dinner, baking buns for the Christmas fair, giving the children the choice as to whether they went to school or stayed at home, welcoming the enormous outpouring of goodwill from friends and neighbours and the many visitors, and also liaising with GP and hospice nurses around pain medication and a hospital bed. There is a great deal to do when someone is dying. And what I realise now is that much of what I've done with Katie is what an end-of-life doula does. Katie died in her own home in December 2010. But there were some things we did not get right. We didn't talk to the children openly about what was happening in the last week of Katie's life. Partly this was led by Katie, who felt that a conversation that allowed the possibility of death was an admission of giving up hope. And we all live on hope. And if she gave up hope, might the children think she was giving up hope on them? This is a very familiar and understandable anxiety of a parent who is dying. We want to protect you, children, but I know that now that not telling them what is ahead is not protecting them. Palliative care consultant Dr. Catherine Mannix, who's worked with many families in, uh, at bereavement and end of life, says not talking is not an act of love. Talking is the act of love. But as Mannix recognises, it takes courage to have this kind of conversation. And when it is needed, we don't get the opportunity to practice. So from this pivotal experience, I understood how privileged I'd been to be so close to Katie and her family. And I've also realized that in being close to her and easing her pain, I was easing my own sadness. Through the practical gifts of sharing humor, care, memories, and tears, with her and her family, and witnessing her dying peacefully in her own home. And as I tell my story, I know that many of you too will have been present for the deaths of people that you've been close to, and may also have known something of what I'm describing. With it, the intensely personal, raw, complex emotions that arise, the anger, perhaps a sense of unfairness, why them? Why not me? Maybe there was suffering, or loss of dignity, or for you a sense of helplessness, of being a bystander at this most important event. These memories stay with us. As Dame Cicely Saunders, the founder of the hospice movement, has said, how people die remains in the memories of those who live on. Her aspiration for the hospice movement was that people would be offered an opportunity to die peacefully with palliative care and to live well until the end. She said, you matter because you are you and you matter until the end of your life. The challenges of these experiences of death in both my personal and professional life drew me to the work of Dr. Hermione Elliott, founder of Living Well, Dying Well Training an organisation with, with which I have since trained to become a doula, and I'm now a trainer of doulas. Hermione, who had a background in midwifery and palliative care, 
recognize that as a society, we have become alienated from death and dying. She describes us as inwardly unprepared and outwardly unskilled at dealing with it. A recent survey asked people where they would like to die, and 70% of respondents said they wanted to die at home or in a hospice. As you will see from these figures, in fact, only 27% of us die at home, and 5% die in hospices. In part, this is due to lack of provision for care in the community and limited places in hospices. But it's also that people worry. People worry that they may be a burden to others, or that their pain may be managed less well in a hospice in, at home than it would in a hospice or hospital. Or that people may, friends and others, may abandon them at this time, and they may die alone. Dying at home is of course not right for everyone. Ultimately, it's our choice, but these figures would suggest that if we had the confidence and knew we could be supported, more of us might choose to die at home. So where do end-of-life dealers fit into this picture? Doulas do some of what I've done by instinct with my friend Katie. We may do it with friends and family, <coughs> but we also do it with people we don't know. A doula is sometimes called an amicus mortis, or a friend in death. Doulas recognize that the decision to die at home is complex. Death can't be predicted, unlike a birth. Families have to live with the unknown, and life will be disrupted. Doulas are ordinary citizens, members of communities. They aim to support families and carers to look after their loved ones and have confidence to be with them as they're dying. Doulas prepare people for what happens to the physical body as it untethers from life. Doulas also recognize that there is a spiritual dimension to death. Whatever one's belief, the fact that mind, body, and spirit are connected and at the end of life, more than ever, we need to think about this as the end of a life's journey, not simply the shutting down of a physical body. Doulas also help people to plan in advance what they may want at this stage. We plan for most other important events in life, so why do we not plan for death? And they start by meeting the individual and are led by their wishes. And they recognize that every death, like every life, is different. They encourage people to consider these kinds of questions. And perhaps the most important thing about being an end-of-life doula is simply being a step ahead. We've been there before. In some senses, I see this as a return to the times when, before we had a National Health Service, there would have been someone in this town who would have been responsible for helping families at this time, perhaps even the same person who would have helped families at birth. And with a growing older population and a reducing younger population, we have to do things differently. What we know is there's no shortage of compassion in this community. Our response to the COVID pandemic showed that. And death and dying is a whole community challenge. And in order to rise to this challenge, we need to think about who is in our community, what are our skills, what do we know about them, what perhaps do we not know about them. We're lucky here in Bridport. We have dialogue groups, death cafes, soul midwives, local support groups like the Living Tree Cancer Support Network, faith groups, and many other voluntary organizations. But are we thinking about those who are not accessing these groups? Those who are not surrounded by friends and family? There will still be people in our community who are dying alone. How do we make sure that this no longer happens? It's sometimes said that dying is an equalizer. It is the one phenomena that will happen to all of us, just regardless of wealth or status. Sadly, the way we die is far from equal in the UK today. A good life and a good death are intrinsically connected. The same inequalities and injustices that exist in life continue until death. And so in death, as in life, 
we need to be thinking about the whole person. Their social situation, their housing, their marginalization, their chosen family and networks of support. So what do we need to do this work? Doulas don't need complex degrees or qualifications. Rather, we need a set of sensibilities, some experience, an ability to recognize the signs as physical death approaches, an understanding of what it is to listen, to be present, to hold space without judgment, and to learn a language to start trusting relationships and nurture them, and to start courageous conversations. We also need to be able to work alongside the many agencies that can be present at the end of a life. And we need to remain centered and compassionate in the face of suffering, and to at least have thought about our own mortality. So, it's time to talk about dying. And we all have a responsibility to start this conversation when we're healthy, well, and active. Let's not wait until it comes up close. Let's talk about it now with our friends, our colleagues, our neighbours, our families, our grandparents. Let's talk about it in schools so that we can start to get used to the language. The process of dying takes only minutes. The rest is living. Becoming more comfortable with talking about death and dying is about improving our connection with each other. It's about finding the language to ignite the spark of meaning and relationship at this most significant moment in life. This work is a gift from one human being to another. It's a reciprocal act, knowing that in the end, we will all die. This is a language of love. I'm going to leave you with the words of palliative care consultant and writer Atul Gawandi. We all want to be the authors of our own stories, and in stories, endings matter. Thank you.